The state budget adopted in late April includes funding for a cost of living increase to nonprofits that contract with the state to provide human services, including help for seniors, young people, the homeless, and New Yorkers with disabilities. But the $237 billion spending plan falls well short of addressing the comparably low salaries for workers on the front lines directly serving New Yorkers in need. To begin to address this issue, Democratic lawmakers have introduced legislation creating a wage board to evaluate pay across the human services sector. To discuss the measure, we're joined on the Capitol Press Room by Michelle Jackson, Executive Director of the Human Services Council, which is the voice in Albany for nonprofit human services organizations. Welcome back to the show, Michelle. Thanks so much for having me. So for starters, can you explain why you think the state needs to invest more in the workers at nonprofits contracting with the state? And what is it about the current dynamic that just doesn't work? There are over 800,000 human services workers in New York State that are paid under government state contracts um, to do a huge span of programs. And they're everything from case managers to janitors to social workers. You know, they do have a range of job titles and a range of responsibilities. And they're absolutely crucial to New York's economy. As we definitely learned during COVID, they were really on the front lines of solving some of our most pressing social issues. And unfortunately, they are also the second lowest paid industry uh, in the state, just ahead of restaurant workers. And they're paid about 30% less than their government counterparts for doing similar work. So a very crucial and huge job force in New York, uh, which is remarkably underpaid, and they're underpaid by the state for that work. The workforce is overwhelmingly women and overwhelmingly people of color. About 57% are women of color. So this is also a racial justice and gender equity issue in addition to being an economic one. Well, what is it about a wage board in particular that would begin to head New York in the right direction of paying these invaluable workers a better wage? We have to figure out why. Why does the state continue year after year to kind of underfund? And by the way, this is not a new problem. This is decades of divestment. There isn't one governor or one legislature that's responsible for this issue. It's just been decades of kind of leaving the sector behind. You know, for example, in your opener, you mentioned the cost of living adjustment that we've got. And for the 15 years prior to Governor Hochul, we had never gotten a full cost of living adjustment in the budget, which means that contracts were lasting upwards of 10 or more years without any kind of increase, meaning that providers, nonprofits couldn't pass on. Um, any increases to their workers. And we all know things cost more (laughs) than they do 10 years ago or 15 years ago. So to investigate, you know, we need a COLA, a cost of living adjustment. And what the governor and legislature did this year was, you know, a step in the right direction. And the last two years, they've also done a great job of investing in the COLA. But our workforce is so far behind that we need to get ahead. And we also shouldn't have to go up every year and ask for the bare minimum. So a wage board would allow us to really investigate how are state agencies setting rates and wages on contracts? What are other ways that we can really get at this wage equity issue in addition to a COLA? And how do we make the COLA actually work better? Because it is not the perfect vehicle for really achieving wage equity. So for example, if you're a social worker who's getting paid $40,000 a year, which you shouldn't be, that's what some of the contracts allow, then a COLA, a 3% COLA or a 2.84% COLA, it doesn't get you to Sixty or $70,000, which is what you really should be making. So the COLA is a super crucial investment, and we also need more, and the wage board can really help illuminate those issues. Well, the mandate of the wage board, according to the legislative memorandum, is to inquire into and report and recommend adequate minimum wages for human services employees. Is this an area where there is a lot of ambiguity or questions surrounding what they should be paid, or is this an area where you feel like the answers are already pretty clear and out there? The answers are not clear. I think what we do know is that a significant amount of nonprofit workers qualify or are on public assistance. We know that we're paid 30% less than government jobs that, do, that are the same or very similar jobs. And there are so many different types of contracts and job titles in the human services world that there isn't a one size fits all answer. So getting just one minimum wage, a janitor versus a social worker versus a case manager, you know, one wage doesn't solve that. And so what what we really want to illuminate with this wage board is the state agencies, they do contracts with nonprofits and they really set the rate 
And what we really want to ask the state agency is, is what are you using <laughs> to set those rates? Um, what are you uh, what are you using to assume that social workers should get paid forty or forty five thousand dollars a year? And look at policies and legislation that would force them to pay more in terms of parity and better align nonprofit jobs with other similarly situated jobs in government or the private sector. Looking at the memorandum again, I see the word recommend. Recommend is not the same thing as mandate. So what would the strength of this board be in actually fostering change here in Albany? I think the big thing is it creates a space for government and the sector to sit down together. State agencies, the legislature, the second floor, nonprofits, we all talk to each other, but not all in one space. And we'll talk to state agencies who say, we would love to pay more, but that was all that's in the budget. And then you hear from the legislature, understandably, they only have limited money to put into the budget. And you know, even with this COLA, for example, it was 2.84% which is a very random number. We were asking for 3.2%, which is the cost of living, you know, the the consumer price index for this year. And the COLA still doesn't cover all human services programs. And we have not gotten a good answer as to why programs like supportive housing and others that are state contracts were left out of the COLA. So the wage board would compel all these different groups to come to the table and seek solutions together. And that's why we say recommend because there, there could be things that we find that we want to fix through legislation or through policy reform. It doesn't all have to be, you know, kind of legislative mandates. So while I don't always love a kind of a plan to have a plan, we need government to invest time and expertise in what are the solutions and also what's happening across the state, not just in New York City or not just in Albany. And a wage board allows a broader set of the community to come together to tackle these issues. Well, you raise the issue of the implementation of the cost of living adjustment in this year's budget, which is that it was not uniformly applied across the human services sector, uh, depending on uh, who actually oversees nonprofits. Some of them uh, found themselves on, on the outside looking in. So is it possible that same dynamic could play out with a wage board, that there could be uh, winners and, and losers, for lack of a better framing? I think that the sector has to use tools that we haven't used before to really press our government partners in different ways and to really get at some of the root causes of these issues. What are the systems changes that can help, you know, right some of those wrongs? And we won't know that unless we sit at the table and really dive into it. And that's something that government hasn't done with us. What HSC's job and the sector's job will be is to advocate even during the wage board to ensure that it covers everybody and that there aren't winners and losers. And that's where the sector has to speak with one voice to say, it's all of us or none of us. And we're also aware that by going through this process, we might find things that we don't like, or there might be recommendations coming from different parties that we don't all get behind. And we have to take chances along with government in engaging in this wage board. Well, right now, is the human services sector united in supporting this wage board? Are there any uh, elements that are maybe concerned about unintended consequences of a wage board? Where does the nonprofit sector fall in this? So the nonprofit sector is vast, so I cannot speak for all of us, uh, but I can say HSC has over 170 members in New York City and the surrounding areas. We partner with great groups across the state who have also sent in letters of support. We've done a call-in day uh, last week where we had a number of organizations in over 40 districts call their legislature. We have unions who are supportive of this. Could there be unintended consequences? But there's already unintended consequences of the COLA. There's also a lot of intended consequences by not doing anything. And so I think we have a lot of broad-based support across the state for this initiative. And understandably, we all have a little bit of trepidation about what this could, you know, how this could look on the other end. But we have to engage in the process to find that out. And in terms of the process, what is the timeline for something like this? It it was to become law, say, immediately. And who would be responsible for actually serving on this board? Wage boards have varied. I think we would push for something that was very time limited, you know, like a year. And by the way, time limit doesn't mean short necessarily. So about a year to engage in this process, it would probably take a couple of months to populate who would be on the wage board and then to kind of do meetings across the state and then come back together. But we would certainly push for it to be very time limited, you know, a year to two years for this whole process to end up in a series of recommendations. And then those recommendations we would have to push to 
pass legislation or work with government agencies to implement the process. So two to three years would be the maximum amount of time that we would think something like this would need to exist and be implemented. And that kind of follows some previous wage boards, but would, I think it also has a narrower scope, so would hopefully move quicker. And the legislature, the second floor, and advocates would have a role in deciding who would populate the wage board. We're asking for 12 seats, which is a little bit bigger than previous wage boards because the sector is so vast and we want to make sure we get statewide representation, different sizes of organization, different types of organizations are represented, and we would have to work with both the governor's office and the legislature to populate that group with not just representatives from nonprofits, but also ensure rep, uh, workers are represented and government agencies have a seat at the table as well. So it would be a group like that, and it would be decided by our amazing champions, Senator Ramos and Assemblymember Bronson of the Labor Committee who are sponsoring this would have a huge role in this and the governor's office as well if it was signed into law. So finally, there are other workers in New York, like the construction unions, who are well looked after when state dollars are spent on their workforce, such as uh, with a prevailing wage requirement. Why do you think the dynamic is so different when we're talking about the human services sector? Is it about the representation with the labor unions? Is it a case of the constituencies that are being served in the human services sector having less pull in Albany? What comes to mind? I think it's definitely the factors that you raise. I think first, we're not one unionized workforce. There's a number of unions that play an incredible role in the nonprofit human services sector. And also a number of nonprofit workers are not unionized, right? So it's a mix of unionized across various unions and non-unionized labor. We don't have the same kind of political or campaign appeal as a union. Um, and that's one of the reasons, you know, 501c3 organizations, aka nonprofits, cannot support candidates, and I think that creates a set of limitations. And something like a prevailing wage is difficult because something we've been looking into is such a varied sector. And so I think there's those kind of technical issues of like how would something like that apply? Because when you can say construction, it's a certain number of job titles, a certain type, type of work to lay out there. And also it's something that's also a mandate on the private sector. So the cost to government is less than something like a prevailing wage in human services where they would have to bear the brunt of the cost. So I think it's complex and, and costly. And those are all about two things government doesn't necessarily like to embrace. And I think that that like, kind of layers of confusion have um, resulted in the de you know, Democrats in particular not being able to embrace it as much as they have been able to embrace other policies. And I think the sector also has had to do some work itself in terms of speaking with one voice, to not be seen as 20 various sectors, but to be seen as one. And the Just Pay campaign has done a lot of work in that area to show this is a politically important sector, and you have to treat us the same as you would other types of community jobs and pay us fairly. And now that we've done that movement building, we are now putting that on our uh, all of our elected officials to see that we are just as important as some of those other uh, types of jobs and therefore de deserve equitable wages. Well, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave things there. We've been speaking with Michelle Jackson. She's the executive director of the Human Services Council. Michelle, thank you so much for making the time. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for you know bringing to light this important issue. Support for the Capitol Press Room provided by the New York State AFL-CIO, a federation of 3,000 unions fighting for working people by keeping New York State union strong. Visit unionstrongny.org for more information. Join us again for Capitol Press Room, a production of WCNY Connected, Syracuse.